Why are you making this shit so difficult? Just just let me save you. Be, fuck with your boy for life. Here. I even got a ring for you. That's real love. Um, the fuck? Is this plastic? I mean, I guess if you want to call uh, high-quality polyurethane plastic, I, I suppose you could call it that. Polyurethane is fucking plastic. Bitch, it, it don't matter about the fucking ring material. Look, it's just, this is about love. I'll do anything for you. That's what it represents. Hmm, anything. So you go cut the mother holes you be talking to off, huh? Let me get this back. Reflections is a four-part arc of the My Little Pony Friendship is Magic main series comics that ran from March 19th to June 25th of 2014, spanning issues 17 through 20. This arc ran during some important points in my life. Part 2 came out right after my birthday, and Part 4 came out the day before I graduated high school. 2014 in general was a big year for me because it was also the year I started this YouTube channel. I started out doing reviews of the comics for multiple reasons. One, the show was on hiatus at the time, so there weren't any new episodes coming out. But more importantly, I was really into the MLP comics and there weren't many reviewers that I saw covering them, much less on a regular basis. I did not cover reflections on this channel, but one thing was clear early on when I talked about my top 5 main series MLP comics. It was my favorite arc. So to celebrate the 10th anniversary of both this arc and this channel, we're gonna see if Reflection still holds that title for me. Given it's been a decade since this arc came out, and several years since I last read it, I think it's in all our best interest to go over the story just so we're all on the same page about what happens in it. Aight? Aight. So part 1 opens with Celestia yeeting herself into a mirror. <laughs> After a week of trying to conceal her disappearance from the public, and using a clown wig to impersonate Celestia is nasty work, she calls on the main six to help, primarily to explore Star Swirl's research lab, since Star Swirl was the one that made that mirror. Turns out that this mirror is a prototype for the one that we saw in Equestria Girls, only this mirror can go to different dimensions. Not sure why a mirror that can go to multiple dimensions would be a prototype for a mirror that can only go to one, as far as we knew at the time, but go off I guess. During the investigation, we're shown via flashbacks that Celestia and Star Swirl spent decades using this mirror to travel to different dimensions, but upon finding out that Celestia had been visiting one particular universe too often, after apparently telling her not to, he immediately halts the project and seals the mirror shut. Realizing that this universe is likely where Celestia took off to, the main six report their findings only for Celestia to finally return and... I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, she got her ass beat. And we end on a shot of what looks to be King Sombra. But Celestia clears things up in part two. Yeah, so like, Sombra is actually a good guy in that universe, and he needed my help because things were going eight shit over there, and me and Luna are evil in this universe, and them hoes jumped me or whatever, so I had to come back. But we gotta do something about this because the worlds are getting too close together, and shit's gonna pop off if we don't fix it, so... Who gonna do it? And Luna, she bought that action, so she ready to go. But apparently, for whatever reason, Celestia and Luna themselves cannot go there because they can't fight themselves or whatever the fuck. Some stop hitting yourself type shit. So the main six jump in to see if they can solve the problem and they're met with the good version of King Sombra. And the lead up to this is shown in tandem with a flashback of Celestia and Star Swirl meeting him under similar circumstances. By getting wrongfully arrested, free my homegirls, you feel me? And not for nothing, Rarity and Fluttershy are down bad. I see them shaky knees, girl. You ain't hiding nothing. And quick tangent, ever since Blue Blood scared Rarity off, she's been maneuvering towards the melanin, and I'm not mad at it. This right here is for all the Jamaican brethren around the world. Sombra fills the main six in on what's going on, but then Evil Celestia and Luna show up, and Evil Celestia is like, what's up, big head? You consider my offer or what? But Twilight, she's like, if you gonna jump our princess, we gonna jump your ass right back. So the main six try to spin the block in the name of Princess Celestia, but they get folded like lawn chairs. The gang finds out that harming the bad Celestia and Luna will harm the good ones back home. The evil sisters leave, and Sombra drops the bombshell that he and Celestia had, to put it in Jadenese, an entanglement. So with that reveal now in play, part three primarily does the legwork of fleshing out Celestia and Sombra's romance, why she got attached to him so quickly, and why her frequent visits started to become a problem. I'll elaborate on the former two questions later, but to answer the third, because these two universes were so similar, frequent visits blurred the lines separating them, and if done in excess, it'll cause the universes to violently merge together. This poses a problem for Celestia, cause that's her man, you know? 
We're then shown the scene of Star Swirl yelling at Celestia again, now that we have the full context of why he was so mad at her to begin with. In the present day, Sombra and the main six come up with a way to defeat the evil sisters without harming the good ones, but evil Luna heard everything, so on to part four. I'm not gonna hold y'all. Most of part four is the final fight. It makes some sense because it's the payoff of everything that parts one and three built up to, but that also makes this the shortest part of our little recap. So the evil princesses show up and just like her good version, evil Luna is about that action. And she's like, yeah, we gonna put all y'all on t-shirts. And evil Celestia is like, we? <laughs> we. <laughs> this makes the good Luna slam into the mirror and shit pops off. The streams are crossing. Celestia decides that because she caused this mess, she should have been the one to fix it all along and hooves are thrown. The main six decide to execute their plan, but because of the universes being almost completely merged, their loophole to avoid harming our Celestia doesn't work anymore. Sombra then makes a decision to sacrifice himself by expelling all of the evil magic from reflected Celestia and Luna and absorbing it into himself. With no time left to say goodbye, the gang leaves. Celestia hangs her remaining mementos of the other world, while the once good Sombra uses the last of his remaining goodness to wish his former sneaky link goodbye. So there's a couple things I want to touch on with this part in particular before I get to critiquing the arc as a whole. While it being mostly payoff isn't bad by itself, it's still comparatively the weakest part of the four for other reasons. Part four kinda rushes through Luna's feelings of being replaced while she was gone, and it feels kinda sudden since at this point in the story, the fact that Celestia was spending time with another Luna wasn't new info to her. The final moments of part four are also pretty rushed. The ending beats just happen one after another without any time for us to really sit with the permanent consequences of what just happened. It was very and then storytelling. Shit pops off, and then Celestia fights, and then evil Celestia and Luna turn good, and then etc etc. And there were definitely some parts that could have been cut to make room. I was initially going to note that Celestia wondering if Star Swirl forgave her is immediately undermined by a flashback of him forgiving her to her face. But upon rereading, I realized that her real concern was that she never worked up the integrity to explicitly apologize to Star Swirl for what she did. He just encourages her that there's no hard feelings, but they never get to have a conversation about it, so it doesn't actually resolve Celestia's guilt. And I kinda like that, because while Star Swirl should have let Celestia say what she needed to say, she should have also said it a lot sooner. Speaking of Celestia, and moving on to talking about this arc as a whole, I want to address the primary sticking point about this arc. Some didn't like the fact that the root of all the problems that happened in this arc come down to Celestia's poor and, let's be real, selfish decisions. That it goes against the image we had of her as a ruler. And I take issue with that for multiple reasons. Firstly, our primary source of information about what Celestia is supposedly like comes from the most biased source possible, her student and the few appearances she did have early on made a point of defying those expectations. Secondly, the majority of the choices she made were centuries ago, long before she's the pony that she is now. Choices that she clearly regrets. I remember Applejack facing similar criticism in Where the Apple Lies. People said that portraying her as a pathological liar in her youth was out of character, even though the entire point of that story was to show a pivotal event that changed her attitude about lying. There's this recurring problem that comes up when characters and their actions are discussed, where people think that a character doing things that you don't like is the same as that character being out of character. This tends to happen with characters that fans boil down to only one trait, or characters that don't appear as much, thus giving fans ample time to make up a version of that character that exists in their heads, and then use that image to judge any future appearances of that character. Worse yet, when a character does something wrong and you make a point for how that character would come to that decision, suddenly you're justifying what they did. I can say in no uncertain terms that what a character did was the wrong thing to do and still get told that I agree with their decisions. Celestia and Luna appear so infrequently that both the show and the comics have varied their personalities a bit. So what even is in character for them at that point? 
Luna as the straight mare and Luna as the outrageous one are equally valid as far as I'm concerned. And with all that said, we can use the few things that are consistent about Celestia to easily see why she did the things she did in this arc. It's made very clear that once Luna started to become distant and isolated, Celestia got more into helping Star Swirl with his research to distract herself. And once she found a universe that was damn near identical to her own with a friendlier Luna, it was a Reynolds rap at that point. Honestly, if you ask me, I think having this version of her sister around was what initially made Celestia like visiting that universe, and then Sombra, being the specimen that he was, just sealed the deal, among sealing some other things. They start fucking, it was gross. Her own version of Luna getting banished to the moon likely only made her attachment to this universe even worse. With all these circumstances in mind, I get why Celestia couldn't let this universe go. Still, while I don't agree with the notion that Celestia was characterized poorly, there is a way that the themes of this arc could have been conveyed better. Everything the main six did in this story, have Luna do it instead. So much of this story revolves around what Celestia had done in the past while Luna was either isolated or banished. In this comic, Luna even says that she wasn't as close to Star Swirl as Celestia. So why not have Luna investigate his research, have her read all the old logs herself instead of sending the main six to do it for her and then reporting their findings. By making her more proactive in the story, Luna gets to learn all these things about Celestia alongside us, the reader, rather than being the last to know everything, both in and out of universe. Have the main six hold down the fort while Celestia and Luna go into the mirror. They spend a page and a half explaining why they can't, but that doesn't have to be the case. The writer has control about how the rules of alternate dimensional travel work. So Luna learns just how much her sister really missed her, and Celestia learns that just like how she should have spoken up and apologized to Star Swirl before it was too late, she should have talked to Luna more too. And Celestia realizes that she probably wouldn't have been so dependent on relationships with people in a universe that wasn't even hers if she had nurtured the ones that she had in her own universe. Considering that the entire show is kickstarted by Celestia sending Twilight off to create her own relationships to nurture, that would bring everything full circle. So knowing that there's one crucial way that this arc could have been better, and knowing that I didn't finish all the MLP comics, I can't say if this is still the best arc of the main series, but it's definitely still my favorite. I haven't read this arc in years, and it was a blast reading it again for its 10th anniversary. As someone that enjoys when Celestia and Luna are on screen, as someone that enjoys Katie Cook's writing and Andy Price's art, and as someone that loves this often overlooked section of the Friendship is Magic series, this arc gave me so much of what I wanted back then. And while an older, more experienced perspective does show a lot of the ways in which this arc could have been better, it's still one of the best if you ask me. So whether this is your first experience with the arc or you read it back in the day, I hope you enjoyed this trip down memory lane as much as I did. We did get robbed by not seeing good Chrysalis though. Where's she at? So what did you think of Reflections? Swarm that comment section below or bug me on social media. Until next time, keep it sketchy folks.